My name is uh, David Luke. I'm a professor in practice here at the Yosalji Institute for Africa um, uh, here at LSE. And it's my honor and privilege to chair this uh, session uh, of the Africa Talk today, uh, which is on 65 years of central banking in Ghana. And we have um, a distinguished uh, panel. Um, on my right is uh, Dr. Ernest Addison, the governor of um, uh, the Central Bank of Ghana. Welcome, Dr. Addison, and we look forward to hearing from you. And on my left is Dr. Angela Lusigi, who is the UNDP resident representative in Ghana. And as I was just teasing her, she has a ringside seat on what is going on in Ghana and um, uh, especially uh, well-placed, um, aside from being an economist in own right, uh, well-placed to um, uh, give us a commentary on, on the uh, uh, subject of, 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 the, of the talk uh, today. Um, we also have joining us from New York, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Piroska Nagi Mukahisi, uh, who is um, uh, a visiting professor here at the Philosophy Institute for Africa. And um, uh, glad to see you, uh, Piroska. Um, Piroska is, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen all the bios, I'm not going to get into the bios, but Piroska has. Um, served for many years um, at the IMF and also at the uh, uh, European Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development, and has also been an, a former IMF uh, mission chief for Ghana. So, um, Piroska, I think you know the history. Uh, you know the, uh, uh, where, uh, as you sometimes, sometimes will say, where the bodies are buried. And, um, you know, certainly we're going to try to unearth them here this evening. Well, without further ado, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Addison to uh, make his um, uh, presentation, uh, after which um, our two uh, other panelists, um, uh, Dr. Lusigi and uh, Professor uh, Nagi Mohasi, would um, respond uh, to, the, to, to your presentation. So, Dr. Addison, you have the floor and you can, yes, you can, you can move to um, uh, down there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for that introduction. Let me first start with the London School of Economics uh, for agreeing to host this lecture to mark the 65th anniversary of the Bank of Ghana and Central Bank in, in West Africa. Also to thank Ivo Ajimandria, who promoted this lecture as part of his book project on the Central Bank and the governments that shaped it. Uh, the LSE Alumni Society in Ghana, I understand, very keenly interested in this lecture. And then also to thank you, Professor David Luke, for agreeing to chair this evening's lecture. Last but not the least, to thank Professor Tim Allen, who is the director of the Feroz Naji Institute. And then my fellow panelists, uh, Angela Lusigi with the UNDP in Africa. And then Nagi Kiroski, who used to be mission chief to Ghana when I was director of research. So we worked very closely on the Ghana program uh, in 2007. Mr. Chairman, central banks in sub-Saharan Africa have faced myriad, myriad challenges over the last 50 years, and the Bank of Ghana is, is no exception. We think that as we celebrate uh, 65th anniversary. Before I do that, I should also mention that I have three of my board members present here, Mr. Andrew Boydo, and Dr. Nyante Chi, and Mr. Buckner, who are in London to support this event, as well as other business of the bank. Thank you very much for, for the support, as well as some of the colleagues uh, from the Bank of Ghana who are in town. So thank you all very much for the support. So 65 years of central banking in Bank of Ghana. Also in a sense marks 65 years of central banking in West Africa. So that was the first uh, country in, in West Africa that, that had a central bank. You would recollect that in, in those days, uh, Gold Coast, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Gambia were members of the West African Currency Board, which was established in 1912 with its headquarters in London to oversee monetary activities 
in, in the territories and the colonies. As the countries move towards political independence, Ghana realized that political independence without economic independence was not very meaningful. So along that thought, the Bank of Ghana ordinance was passed into law on the 4th of March, 1957, two days before independence. And the bank commenced business in August, 1957. Now, the immediate post-independence period was clouded by uh, decisions on what, what the central bank was supposed to do, what, what, what was the mandate of a newly established central bank, uh, what should be its governing structure, and, and the issues of, of, of independence of, of the central bank. So you notice that in that 1957 ordinance, this was uh, more or less uh, restricted to just issuing and redeeming bank notes and coins and trying as much as possible uh, to maintain monetary stability and the external value of the currency at that time. However, this rule-based approach to monetary policy making was not consistent, was not consistent uh, with the national policy and objectives at that time. So it was not surprising that the 1957 ordinance was replaced with the Bank of Ghana Act 1963, uh, which is Act 182. Now that Act 182 refocused the mandate of the bank towards a more development-oriented uh, framework. Consequently, the bank, among the policies that were implemented, included imposing interest rate ceilings, foreign exchange regulations and allocation, as well as directed credit to different sectors of the economy. It went as far as establishing a department for development financing. By 1963, the act was also re-amended again in 1965. This is the Bank of Ghana Amendment Act of 1965, uh, where the then government uh, took stronger interest in, in the management of the bank and the directorships at that time were uh, made by the Minister of Finance. You would see that the Bank of Ghana Amendment Act at the time reflected the difficulties that the Ghanaian economy had started experiencing in 1965 with sharply declining foreign exchange reserves. And this is really the motivation for why the, the government uh, took more interest in the appointments to the board of the bank. Now, between 1970 and 2002, there were, the country was governed by a series of military governments and the Central Bank Act was kept intact till 2012, when the new Bank of Ghana Act was promulgated. This 2012 Act was also amended in 2016. I'll come back to the latest Act and what that Act tries to do. But like all central banks uh, in developing countries, the, the, some of the technical difficulties that the bank had to deal with had to do with the fact that uh, financial markets tend to be shallow and therefore conducting monetary policy in, through secondary markets was difficult to do. Uh, there were issues about monetary policy transmission processes uh, in shallow financial markets. Uh, there was the difficulty of having an effective monetary policy when you have fiscal dominance because the impact of the fiscal on aggregate demand tends to be much stronger. There were issues about the exchange rate channel, which were also not allowed to function appropriately because of concerns about the impact of the exchange rate in the economy. The wealth channel was no better because of the lack of markets in, in bonds and real estate and stocks. Perhaps the more important channel was the bank lending channel. And yet even here, the transmission of policy rate decisions through banking lending rates uh, tend to be incomplete. We didn't see the full pass through going from our policy rates to the lending rates of the banks. And these were typically challenges that central banks in, in, in developing countries face, and Ghana was not different. In addition to that was the volatility of fiscal policy in uh, 
developing countries like ours, where you tend to see a lot of pro-cyclical fiscal policy as the taxation from the commodity sectors tends to influence the level of government spending. And there is very little intertemporal smoothing of government spending. As I said, the more recent act for the Bank of Ghana was the Act 612, which marked a turning point and refocused the bank on the issue of price stability as the most important uh, primary objective of the bank. And then also bringing in the issue of economic growth, banking systems as secondary objectives, secondary to the objective of price stability. In addition to that, the Act established the Monetary Policy Committee, which takes the decisions on the policy rate. And, and the committee itself is made up of seven members with technical knowledge on the subject of monetary policy formulation. Two of these members of the committee are external members and are not appointed by the government. And this is unique to the Bank of Ghana. There are not many central banks in our sub-region that have monetary policy committees that are uh, this strong. Secondly, that act also provided for the operational independence of the central bank, even though the government and the bank jointly set the target for inflation, the, the bank has the responsibility of initiating proposals for the formulation of its policies, as well as providing the statistical data and advice needed for that. It's been said that an independence of a central bank does not mean that the central bank does not interact with the government. Indeed, our former president at the inauguration of the Monetary Policy Committee recognized the importance of well-specified mechanisms for cooperation between the bank and the government, and saying that such interaction need not compromise the bank's ability to carry out its mandate. Later on, we will discuss how this one, one such mechanism, the memorandum of understanding, allowed us to keep central bank financing out of the picture for a number of years. Now, another important factor for the Monetary Policy Committee is the challenge of communicating the central bank's decisions to investors. So we have spent quite some time to build the capacity of, of our staff, work with the Bank of England uh, to effectively communicate monetary policy uh, decisions, and then also to come up with uh, bi-monthly press releases and press conferences, as well as publishing the data packs that summarizes key variables that forms the basis of the monetary policy committee's decisions. All of these reports are published regularly after every monetary policy committee meeting. The Act tackled the issue of monetary financing, as I had said earlier on, uh, prohibiting the, the financing of uh, government spending uh, permanently. Indeed, the Act provided for just the 10% of the previous year's total revenue for financing. The amendment in 2016 sought to eliminate the central bank financing of government completely. Unfortunately, that was not uh, very popular with the legislators in parliament and they refused to do that. And however, they, they reduced the ceiling to central bank lending to just 5% of the previous year's tax revenue. I must say that this issue of fiscal dominance has been a major factor uh, playing out in the inflation experience of Ghana. So under the most recent ECF engagement with the IMF, there is a conditionality on zero central bank financing. And the central bank and the Ministry of Finance uh, signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to stick to this zero financing. And I believe that if you look at the inflation experience uh, over the last three years, uh, between that time, uh, 2017, up to 2019, one could see that it has been effective in keeping uh, prices relatively low. So what are the current challenges facing central bank? Uh, I mentioned the issue of 
fiscal dominance. I don't want to go through the details of that. But the issues that concern us currently, uh, the issue of the high debt vulnerabilities and how that in a sense affects the behavior of governments to be able to uh, keep within the expenditure targets. And this debt situation has been compounded since the COVID-19 pandemic hit. As you're aware, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic came in in 2020, at which time we had seen a very significant improvement in our economic performance. The growth rates were uh, relatively high, uh, at almost 7%. Uh, inflation had come down. I was telling uh, the chairman, they did look and the team there about the improvements that we had seen uh, in our financial system with the increased capital buffets. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic brought up the issue of the governments and the government's role in managing the crisis. And this had to be done through fiscal interventions, which in a sense protected a lot of the lives and livelihoods. And uh, earlier discussion, I think Angela was talking about how those measures were very effective in preventing a recession in Ghana. And Ghana was one of the few countries that uh, did not experience a recession in, in, in 2020. So we saw our fiscal expenditures grow significantly at that time uh, through the accommodative conditions that were created uh, to stabilize the economy. Since then, we have had fairly difficult uh, times trying to access financing, the access financing uh, for, for, for the fiscal side of our economy. Uh, and that creates difficulties, uh, creates difficulties in terms of the sustainability of, of, of the stance. And this is really one of the issues on the, the broader view of what fiscal dominance is, that you could have soft fiscal dominance uh, where you have central banks trying to maintain accommodative financial conditions to contain domestic borrowing costs. It is one of the types of fiscal dominance that you can see. And at a time that you are experiencing rising inflation, how do you manage to contain domestic borrowing costs? And also because this domestic borrowing cost eventually feeds into the issue of, of debt sustainability. In a situation where economic growth is weak, supporting fiscal policy can also be constrained by high public debt. And then the central bank has to play a more proactive role to support the economy through sometimes lending to private sector or troubled state institutions. What is clear from the existing literature is that the incidence of central bank lending to governments in Sub-Saharan Africa has been higher than elsewhere, amounting to about 2% of GDP on average, compared to 0.5% in other jurisdictions. However, we have witnessed a break away from the zero lending to government as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Some central banks have had to lend to governments as financing gaps widened and constrained fiscal policy implementation among revenue shortfalls due to the slowdown in economic activity. An indirect form, which has also complicated the conduct of monetary policy. This is the high financing gaps and the dependence on external financing to close such high financing gaps. And this, in a sense, uh, forces central banks to undertake monetary policy to ensure the external financing premium remains to keep domestic assets attractive to non-resident investors. So this also becomes a source of constraint. In the ECA program, 
the ceiling that was given to the government was actually a ceiling on gross financing from the central bank. And this really was not in line with the zero, zero financing in the ECF. And as I had said earlier on, our legislature did not really agree to that particular uh, level of financing. But we signed a memorandum of understanding with the government to ensure that the financing levels were low. Let me move on to the more recent developments, in particular what we have seen uh, since the beginning of this year, where we have seen the external shocks that have come through uh, to almost all emerging and market and developing economies. As countries in the sub-region became increasingly integrated into the global trade and financial networks. The uncertainty sur surrounding the timing of monetary policy in the advanced countries has also increased the volatility of capital flows to emerging markets and developing economies, as well as the African frontier economies, some of which has led to uh, sudden reversals of capital flows leading to very large and disorderly depreciation in the exchange rates with adverse implications for both inflation and financial stability. There have been other exogenous shocks, as you're aware, the oil price shock, the pandemic, have also brought significant challenges to monetary policy implications. We were again discussing this issue of the supply side shocks that we have seen uh, coming in. And I had to make the point that Monetary policy does not really uh, focus on the supply side shocks, but we are looking at the second round effects of, of these uh, supply side shocks and how they affect the anchoring of long term inflation expectations and the behavior of you know, wage ag agitation. So really, this is the only reason why uh, central banks reacted to the recent inflation uh, spiral that we have seen. As I said, in Ghana, we saw inflation jump literally uh, from 7% a year ago to nearly 28%, 27.4% to be specific, uh, at the latest reading. We had anticipated in 2021 that we would need to tighten policy. So the Monetary Policy Committee raised the policy rate by 100 basis points in November 2021, only for us to see inflation go further up in January. And then in, in January, we had the Ghanaian economy being downgraded, uh, which immediately you know, sent our currency into a spiral because it was very clear that for a country that has been uh, Borrowing nearly two billion to three billion every year on the capital markets. If we are not able to go to the capital market to borrow, then the outlook for the uh, currency was was not that strong. We saw a very sharp depreciation in the currency. We therefore had to again raise our policy rate by two hundred and fifty basis points uh, in the March meeting, and then. Still, we saw inflation still going up. We had to raise it again uh, by 200 basis points, accumulating 450 uh, basis points over the last few months. So really, this is the challenge that we are seeing uh, in a small open economy such as ours, uh, which is uh, subject to all these global shocks. And, and the central bank's role in trying to mitigate the impact of, of these shocks. And, 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 and I think that this is a challenge that most uh, sub-Saharan African central banks are currently grappling with. Some of the measures that we uh, at the central bank level had to uh, take included, you know, some of the financial stability measures to keep our banking sector uh, stable. 
Let me move on to a more interesting subject, which Angela was talking about, Mr. Chairman, the issue of digitization and the Bank of Ghana, uh, given that everything is being digitized. Uh, the central bank also has tried to face the challenge of, of, of that uh, financial landscape. Uh, the future of money, as we have heard, probably is in digitization. So currently, Ghana is piloting a central bank digital currency, even though Nigeria has already introduced one. There are other countries in our sub-region that are also seriously considering the CBDC. I had said that the idea of a digital currency for Ghana was quite straightforward because of the experience we had had with mobile money. And a lot of the populace were very comfortable transferring value using mobile phones and therefore creating a token of the domestic currency and, and using the same sort of technology to move that token around, you know, becomes a, a very easy logical step to, 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 to make progress. And we have this um, pilot scheme, which has just about ended in one of the rural towns in Ghana. And the initial tokens for those that were participating in, in the survey, the initial tokens were bought for them so that they could try the ECD and, and, and give feedback to the, the surveyors. The feedback that we got was that those who ran out of tokens actually used their own resources to buy more tokens. So for us, that was very good feedback on, on how the future for a digital or an ECD will be in Ghana. So I know I have just 20 minutes. I, unfortunately, I have to rush through what I'm trying to say. But to conclude, I think that the central bank has come a long way, 65 years, trying to model through what its mandate should be. Should it be concerned more about development or should it just focus on the currency board type of stability? And this was a debate that they had right from the beginning in 1957. And the ordinance opted for a stability-oriented you know, central bank. Barely five years into that, they, they were not happy with that stability, and they wanted to see more development-oriented activities by the central bank. So you saw that the act again was revised. And then as the economic conditions deteriorated, we saw further amendments to the act until everything got out of hands and the military took over. And then we see that when the democracy was restored, the issue of the rule of the central bank came up again. And then we have a new act, which really focuses the central bank on price stability, which we have been operating since 2016. Now that act also gave powers to the central bank to do the cleaning up of the financial sector. So we, we had an act that had gave the central bank powers of resolution. So that if there were financial institutions that were failing, we had the power to take them out. So that act in 2016 has sort of strengthened the hand of the central bank. It's made it more independent in dealing with the issue of central bank financing of government. It's made it stronger to deal with the issue of weak financial institutions that are not being uh, respecting uh, prudential regulations. And we saw the benefits of that through the improvements in, in the broader economy over the three years or so that we were in, in office between 2017 and 2019. At that time, the central bank had a memorandum of understanding for zero financing of the budget. The government itself had committed itself to a ceiling of 5% deficit. And then COVID-19 broke. So what does the ceiling of 5% fiscal deficit mean 
what does an MOU mean when human lives are involved? So we had to more or less jettison all these nice rules, rule-based approaches to managing the economy, and then be a little bit more practical in trying to deal with the issues of the day. And obviously, moving away from these strict uh, limits, obviously, also leads to uh, the instability that we are seeing. A lot of it is global. It's uh, coming from, you know, shocks from the Fed, shocks from Russia and Ukraine. But then we also have our own underlying uh, fiscal issues, which it probably has made our uh, situation a little bit more difficult than in other circumstances. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think you also um, uh, able to uh, explain to us um, how the twin shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, hit the Ghanaian economy, as well as, of course, now this year, uh, the shock from the um, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war. Uh, it did occur to me that if you were giving this speech in 2019, um, it would have been a very different speech because you ended with this um, note of uh, crisis, um, crisis, uh, in uh, dealing with the fallout, as you rightly point out, the secondary effect of the supply, sh supply side uh, shock. Um, but um, also uh, high inflation now that you have to deal with, um, whilst at the same time trying to ensure that the economy continues to grow, so to square that circle. Um, um, and then, of course, the problem with the rating, uh, the country's rating, which has uh, fallen as, as, as a result. Um, so I think uh, you've given us uh, great insights into these issues. And as I've said, it would have been a much more celebratory atmosphere we would have had in, if this speech was given in 2019 rather than now in 2022. But um, you ended um, with a very important point, uh, which I think we should all take uh, good note of. And that is, the, um, despite this current crisis, the uh, continuing efforts to innovate, uh, to deepen the financial system using new digital uh, tools. And I think that's um, a very important uh, thing because what it means is that you're making the financial system open to everybody. And that is what we, we want to see. So thank you very much. I think so, so very strong insights here. We're going to come back to interrogate uh, many of these issues. The question of fiscal dominance, uh, I think is inevitable in a developing country context when you're also fair fighting and so on. But I'm sure that uh, others will have some insights and also the international context. Um, I would argue that the international um, uh, system has not responded uh, as effectively and efficiently as it could have to um, uh, developing countries in this uh, crisis, but we could come back uh, to this. So um, it's now my honor to turn to uh, a good uh, former colleague, a UNDP colleague, um, uh, uh, Dr. Angela Lusigi, to um, give her comments uh, to Dr. Addison's uh, speech. So Angela, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor, and, and congratulations, uh, Dr. Edison, for such illuminating remarks that really walk us through what has been going on with the central bank and the changing role. So my comments are really going to be around what you started, the discussion you talked about, new roles, new expectations, and new partnerships, very much arguing for that development-oriented framework for the central bank um, and a more proactive role. And I, I will end with looking at some of the levers that could be considered for, for, for some of this. Uh, for some of you who may not be uh, familiar with the United Nations Development Program, we're the development arm of the UN system, and we provide integrated development solutions that are anchored on country priorities, very much looking at three drivers. How can we have greener and fairer structural transformation? How can we have inclusion to make sure no one is left behind in growth? And also, how do we build resilience to shocks? Because uh, much of the progress and much of the discussion we're talking about now is about the shocks from COVID and other shocks that are happening. So that very much is at the forefront of our agenda. So in speaking about the emerging role for the, for the central bank, uh, and this is a case study of Ghana, but could probably be applied to a lot of other countries in Africa. I, I'd like to fix our attention on the COVID crisis and some of the things that um, happened in Ghana that, that are very instrumental to the recovery. 
And if you look at the COVID crisis, it had three clear dimensions. There, were the, there was a health effects, um, there was a social economic effects, and also the long-term effects. And then also beyond COVID, we've just talked about, you know, the unfold, unfolding climate, environmental, fuel, energy, uh, and food crisis. It, it just seems that there are shocks all the time. So we really, even as we're looking at COVID as an example, we can really extrapolate that to, to handling some of the other shocks. So what happened with, with COVID and health effects? We lost lives. Um, and that was significant. And it also revealed a gap in uh, the functioning health systems, the inclusion, and, and the fact that we needed to transform. And in the case of Ghana, there was a lot of investment in using data, in using digital to, to be able to ensure the continuity of health services and also empowering local actors. And the future is really looking at how we can have more um, locally uh, manufactured vaccines and equipment. And I'm talking about this because all this needs money, all this needs investment. So that's also is, is one of the challenges as we're looking at, at the recovery, uh, we very much have to look at where is the investment going to come from and how can we sustain it? And then let's look at the socioeconomic effects um, from COVID-19. Uh, we lost jobs, uh, we did a, a survey of, of businesses that were impacted by COVID-19, many businesses closed and it took almost nine months for them to reopen. Um, the issues around food insecurity, disrupted social services, education in particular. And what it revealed was that there is an important role for social protection and, and social services. And what the government provided at that time was relief, um, including cash transfers. Um, the governor already talked about support to uh, businesses, uh, I know um, even uh, water and electricity utilities were paid for a while. So again, you begin to see what envelope was required to cover what we are looking at now as a recovery. And no sooner had we started to recover than new threats um, showed up. So again, you see a very active role um, in, in you know, providing that protection, but also building the, the, the recovery going forward. And what about the longer term effects? Well, um, the governor talked about falling revenues and commodity price fluctuations. So just at the time when you needed more financing, what was coming in um, was reducing and, and that led, led to the shrinking fiscal space and also rising debt. So these are some of the roots of, of what we're now seeing and, and, and responding to. Um, he also talked about macroeconomic instability and the discussion around inflation, currency fluctuation, um, and I think something that was very important that you raised was the fact that these are, were considered cyclical in the past, but now they're actually longer term trending issues. So the instruments that we are looking at to deal with, with uh, issues around inflation and currencies, are actually global problems that are now internalizing. And now we need to look at more um, long term instruments and, and partners partnerships to be able to deal with this. Another long-term effect was around reversals in global trade. Uh, just at the time when you know, we were trying to stabilize and get access to all sorts of things, uh, including uh, vaccines and PPE, there are more barriers to trade that are rolling, rolling um, around the corner. Um, and this brings me to the point about what do I see and what do I propose as some of the new roles um, building on, on what you had already presented. Of course, the robust macroeconomic and regulatory framework is very, very much required. But again, advocating for a balance with a development-oriented framework, how can we have more multilateral collaboration and regional collaboration in order to be able to deliver the needed fiscal space? Uh, to respond and sustain the kind of responses that we need. Um, looking beyond COVID, um, with the shrinking fiscal space, are we able to, con to keep having that kind of support going forward without really looking at this issue of multilateral collaboration? And, and this brings me to the point about, uh, we really need to look at beyond maintaining macroeconomic stability to actively enhancing growth and rebuilding investor confidence, because I think this is really an important springboard for being able to deal with new um, actors who, who might not um, have adequate space now. And finally, 
it all comes down to how do we foster a regional response to development risk. You spoke about other central banks in the region. Um, as we face ongoing crisis with food insecurity, uh, climate change, conflict and violent extremism in, in the Western Central Africa region, I think very much having that regional lens is important going forward. So finally, just to highlight a few of the things that I think um, came out very clearly as part of the recovery as something that uh, central the central bank should continue is the issue around digitalization um, you mentioned the very important uh, role of financial inclusion and I, I like the example that you gave about digital currencies because if you're thinking about um, SMEs recovering then you'd really need to see how we can modernize service delivery and and using digitalization for instance uh, build on the fact that we now have digital financial identities to be able to create um, sort of credit scores or something uh, that's beyond having assets in hand so that we can actually meaningfully start seeing the liquidity flowing to the real economy. Um, and that brings me to the, uh, the second D, which is developing local economies. Uh, we found around COVID-19 that for the recovery to happen, it had to be spread out. I like the idea of, of working in Sechiria so and some of the other local economies to try and see how we can pool investment um, to, to be able to finance uh, the, the recovery there. Diversification. I'm an agricultural economist by training, so I can't end without talking about the importance of agricultural productivity, inclusive and green structural transformation. And I see the work that needs to be done across borders is very important, um, unlocking the power of trade. And here, the work that the central bank is doing on the cross-border payment platforms um, is very important for trade investment and regional integration. And then finally, you talked about development financing. Um, including uh, improving public financial management, increasing domestic resource mobilization, but also the issues around stopping illicit financial flows and capital flight, uh, really to, to strengthen the economy's capability to generate internal resources is, is very important. Um, and I think all these, the digitalization, developing local economies, diversification and development financing, could go a long way in expanding the fiscal space that we need to power the strategic investment so that uh, we can catalyze growth, we can deliver services, and we can protect people and build economic resilience. So with those few words, I'll hand over back to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, um, Angela. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, well deserved, uh, well deserved. No, thank you so very much. I think you've done two things. Uh, one is, um, you know, to unpack this uh, question of uh, fiscal dominance. And I think you've actually put a human face on the issues, uh, especially around COVID, the um, measures that the uh, central government needed to take uh, to ensure a level of social uh, protection and, and so on. And then I think, uh, Governor, uh, she has given you um, a number of um, insights into how you can dig yourself out of the hole that you, if I could put it that way, that you're currently in. And uh, I think here, um, you know, certainly I think these points that you, you've raised uh, around um, the questions uh, and, and measures to um, ensure that there is, uh, there is fiscal space, uh, not to forget the development uh, dimension, not to forget uh, growth, uh, the role that trade can play uh, uh, here, um, of course, um, as part of development, also the question of um, uh, diversification, and then, of course, taking into account um, that we live in, in, in a world in which um, we need to uh, pay a lot of attention to the, susten the sustainable impact of um, all of the above, uh, so to say. So you brought this uh, question of uh, green uh, structural transformation very much um, into the uh, picture. So I think uh, these are some of the policy measures um, that practically can be taken to ensure that um, going forward, uh, growth uh, is also inclusive and there's uh, equity and fairness. I think um, uh, these are important uh, issues that we should uh, keep in, in mind. Having said that, um, now delighted to turn to my colleague, uh, Professor 
Piroska Nagi Bakahisi to um, uh, give us her own take on uh, the governor's uh, uh, address. And, um, and also especially perhaps um, uh, Piroska to bring out this uh, international dimension out much, much more clearly, because as I said in passing, um, the international response uh, to um, these uh, emerging economies, developing economies really has been far short of what one would have expected. But um, over to you, Piroska. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, thank you, David, uh, for inviting me for this uh, phenomenal panel. It's such a big honor to, to, uh, to share the virtual platform for me, at least from here. Uh, with with uh, Dr. Addison, whom I always admired, I can uh, say, you know, back back at the good old times when we were together, um, me myself from the IMF, and and also Dr. Lucigi, whose comments were hugely insightful. I learned a lot. Um, my objective here is just to complement uh, these uh, both um, sort of excellent interventions, and. Who uh, as, as David uh, just asked me to put the whole thing in its, uh, the whole issues more in an international perspective, maybe more in the context of what's happening in emerging markets in general, uh, what has been happening and what are the new challenges, and in central banking in general. Before doing so, I cannot not do um, some, uh, some appreciation because one has to say that, you know, Ghana has been in, a pioneer in so many respects. Like we heard that it was the first central bank uh, um, that, was, uh, that, uh, that was established in Africa that was in Ghana. But I recall also, as, as, as um, uh, Governor Edison you know, very humbly said, but, but Ghana was among the very first, if not the first, to, in, to introduce the whole thinking and framework of inflation targeting, for, 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 uh, focusing on inflation uh, stabilization. Um, back in the early, early 2000s, so we're talking about 20 years ago. And yes, there have been issues, the fiscal dominance, and then I see it's recurring, <laughs> just as at the, at, at the, those, those uh, older times. But, but the, the, the thinking, the framework, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the high quality of staff was, was, was always there, and, and taking risks um, um, in, in introducing uh, new, new frameworks. I would also say that, yeah, there, was, there has been obviously a, a major fiscal easing. I agree with, with Angela that uh, you know, those were exceptional times in the COVID, so we can call it fiscal dominance, uh, but, but you know, it, it's called, it is called quantitative easing <laughs> in other parts of the, of the world. And actually, this is something that, uh, that, is, uh, that, that I think actually could be seen as, as, as positive. And then, of course, we, knew about the, we all know about the electric uh, eat SADI, this is very famous, I have to say. It's, it's a nice competition with, 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 uh, with Nigeria, but the Digital Ghana agenda is, is actually well known beyond the borders of uh, not only Ghana, but uh, West Africa. So there's a lot of innovation, a lot of risk-taking, a lot of uh, fresh thinking, and, that's, uh, and, and I, I salute you, uh, Governor, and, 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 and the Bank of Ghana for that. Now, I will make four points. One, of why we can be humble about the current challenges of, 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 of today, but as, as David was alluding to, we have to take stock of the major achievements that emerging markets have done in central banking. Um, and that will be my first point, uh, explaining a little bit. Then, facing the, the, uh, the, the obvious in the room, not in an elephant, uh, um, facing it has on, inflation is back, is, is back with a vengeance. What to do about it in the emerging market context, and, and how much uh, you know similarities and differences there vis-à-vis uh, -vis advanced countries is an issue. I think, and it's worth exploring a little bit. Uh, then, what central banks can do about it in, in emerging markets, particularly, and then um, maybe some humble lessons, indeed, about uh, what to do next in, 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 in terms of. The profession is it's not about Ghana, it's not about emerging, the, the portion of central banking to re-establish some credibility, because some credibility has been lost, let's be honest. Okay, first the achievements. Um, central banking in emerging markets has seen a quiet revolution in the last decade. This is Ghana, this is Africa, but in general, we have seen inflation coming down. I mean, obviously they are episodes and they are, you know, some outliers. But we have seen inflation coming down everywhere. 
Um, financial stability, as, 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 as the governor rightly said, is a precondition for any sustainable growth, microfinance, um, you know, uh, distributive uh, equality. So that has happened that prior to the crisis. It, it's been a massive improvement. And that's because of the, uh, the good framework, because of the credibility, uh, because of the taking of, 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 of governors and staff uh, as, 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 as in, in the Bank of, of Tana. Now, built on that credibility, actually what we saw during the COVID crisis in a broader context is that emerging markets were able to mount an anti-cyclical monetary response and a policy response overall, uh, which was unprecedented. In the past, when there was an external shock, I mean, obviously the COVID was, you know, the extent of the external, the global, for everybody simultaneously. But in, the, in, in, in all the times, emerging markets couldn't react, couldn't react proactively, couldn't increase uh, fiscal deficit if, if, if uh, um, uh, um, social needs uh, required. This time around, it was possible without risk to, uh, to, to the exchange rate, without uh, major spillovers um, uh, through inflation, at least in the first the real crisis case, a crisis um, response case in 2020. And I also read positively that the Ghana was one of the few, as Angela said, you know, countries who, who didn't suffer a recession in 2020 at a price because that went up, public that went up, but it was incredibly important to avoid that, uh, you know, being dragged down um, uh, for, for years um, in, in, in recession. So, so that was a huge um, um, a first for emerging markets. Um, and that was done just as in advanced countries were very similar, smaller scale, obviously, because the fiscal and, and monetary space is just more limited in, in, in these countries uh, than in advanced countries. But, but we saw a very similar policy mix in advanced countries mounting this anti-cyclical um, um, uh, crisis response. I think it was a tremendous and, 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 and you know, a source of pride. But the problem is that inflation is back and is back because exit from these extraordinary policies was very difficult. Um, the carpets mainly have been advanced countries, um, the Fed and the ECB, these are the systemic central banks of, of, of our era. Um, um, I you know, just made mistakes. Um, and not delaying, taking temporary too long, and, and maybe waiting for the secondary, second round effects. But the fact is that the, the first round effects uh, last for a long time. They you know, become general and, and need uh, perhaps a faster policy response. So inflation is back. And, and we see that, uh, that you know, in, in advanced countries, are, <laughs> the, the population is shocked. They don't know how to do, how to react. I have to say that emerging markets actually have reacted much faster. Even the governor said that you know, they started to raise interest rates you know, half a year before the Fed uh, woke up. Um, and the ECB hasn't done yet uh, a turnaround and there are other ge geopolitical reasons, but, uh, but still inflation is, is too close to double digit in advanced countries. So in a sense, we see Brazil, we saw a host of other emerging markets. We saw emerging markets in Europe to start with monetary tightening uh, basically a year before advanced countries uh, woke up. Now, there is another difference in inflation, and then that is the following, um, that in advanced countries, because they mounted a much bigger um, um, policy package, the crisis package, were able to uh, during COVID, um, they, um, in some cases, particularly in the US, they, um, the, this fiscal stimulus um, um, uh, went on way too long and uh, there is excess demand relative to available supply. So it's a very much demand-driven uh, phenomenon. Of course, supply um, um, constraints and, and the ruptures are there, commodity price increases are hitting these countries, but there is a distinct role of, of excessive demand that um, perhaps we don't see that much in emerging markets. I don't want to exaggerate. Obviously, 
you know, we just heard the governor that there is a fiscal issue and high deficit even this year. So it's not that easy to, to rein in um, on, 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 on the fiscal accounts um, in one go. Um, but it seems that, um, uh, that in, in some countries, uh, India and others, um, the former governor, uh, Raghu Rajan, is professor now in Chicago, former IMF chief economist, uh, makes his point very strongly that supply side constraints seem to be stronger in emerging uh, uh, market economies than, than in adverse countries. Uh, moreover, emerging market economies now suffer from the negative spillovers uh, from advanced country monetary tightening, because in the end, the Fed has started to increase and, and it, 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 it's, it's like it, this is going faster than, uh, than it originally for our guidance right, uh, communicated. Um, and, and it will ad ad address its big balance sheet as well. So there, will, there is a multifaceted um, reaction to the very high inflation that, uh, that we see in the US and, and as for in advanced countries. Um, but this time around, the negative spillovers are coming through. Um, external demand will be much uh, lower for emerging markets, including countries in Africa, much higher borrowing costs, uh, no question, capital outflows, that needs to wade in and then there comes a problem when it comes to investment. And of course, countries with high debt, and uh, Ghana is among them, or high share of foreign, ex foreign exchange in money that uh, can, can find themselves in, in, a, in a hot situation very quickly when this happens. Um, now, what emerging markets can do in this context? High inflation, obviously, you know, this is the primary mandate as the governor at the moment of, of the central bank to address uh, the, 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 this, this problem. So it's a very, very, I don't, don't envy you, Mr. Governor, it's a very delicate balancing act um, to, to try to see, to tighten enough to, to avoid too much capital outflow, limit capital outflow, and make available capital uh, for the economy. Um, not to dampen too much demand, but at the same time, credibly, you know, taming on inflation, which if it runs to close to, you know, 28 from last year, seven, it's, 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 it's really a, an issue and has to be, has to be dealt with um, perhaps aggressive. This, this sort of thing. Unfortunately, there is no, you know, um, measure, measure, you know, there, there will be costs. Um, um, uh, but I think, as the governor said, that the, the importance is to focus on 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 on, on, the, or on uh, gradually reducing inflation. But I would say something uh, additional: that just as in the success phase um, uh, during the COVID uh, crisis response, when monetary policy was working hand in hand in fiscal policy and was 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 also coordinated with the right uh, regulatory um, easing and forbearance. So we, we had to think about the policy mix, right? We have to think about when taming on inflation about the policy mix again. So yes, the central bank is, 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 is primarily uh, mandated to deal with inflation, but it cannot do it alone. Or if it is forced to be doing alone, the output costs will be tremendous. So there has to be raining on, on, on fiscal costs and the fiscal deficit and reducing uh, the, the fiscal dominance. So fiscal policy must play a role, some fiscal coordination. And, and then this, is, this is my other point, some supply side reforms are possible to ease the supply constraint, which I think is more dominant in emerging markets these days. Now, when we talk about supply side reforms, we say, oh, you know, this is a long-term thing and, and it takes years to come and blah, blah, blah. Some of it are low-hanging foods. Um, I think maybe in the case of Ghana, because they advance so much, <laughs> there are not that many low hanging food, but I wonder, sort of in terms of, of establishing new business, reducing red tape, easing labor markets, there is still perhaps uh, things to do, dealing with, you know, state enterprises and, and all that. So there, are, there could be some low hanging foods that can ease the, the supply uh, constraint at, at, uh, at home. A little war, warning, I am not saying this is an issue for Ghana, but in general, emerging markets and in general, in, in today's uh, um, you know, populist uh, world, in many countries, it is incredibly important to avoid the temptation of protectionism. Because there is a tendency to think that I erase the trade barriers, I, I uh, create a wall, 
and that could be justifiable uh, you know um, reasons to do that in certain uh, extreme cases but overall it will create just rent seeking it will create uh, you know corruption and limit competition and on the long term it doesn't bring growth so uh, avoiding pro you know for emerging markets particularly avoiding the temptation of protection i think is quite important now finally uh, um i think first central banks have to do what what, uh, what the Governor Edison just did in front of us very humbly to do a little soul searching. Strangely enough, you know, this is maybe easier for those who face the uphill battle of every day of, 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 of balancing uh, the policy, of having the right measures, of explaining it painfully uh, sometimes to the population what has to be done, what can be done, what cannot be done. Um, and this kind of, um, you know, communication, direct communication may be easier in, in emerging markets because we don't see it in the Fed. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in the U.S. and you see that the Federal Reserve, which obviously the most important central bank in the world, and actually I didn't mention, but provided, uh, you know, repo facilities, uh, FX facilities to, to many, many, many countries uh, um, during the COVID crisis, which was brilliant and, and very helpful. So um, they haven't done this soul searching what led to uh, to the mistakes and it's very difficult to fix stuff when when you don't understand what the, what the, what the real, real problem is so uh, and 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 some emerging markets also i think have to think about it and and uh, and again um maybe a finish uh, um, uh, with, with, with with this that and I, in, in that the Bank of Ghana has always excelled, as I started, uh, you know, my little uh, intervention here, saying, innovate. So take I take the example of, of, the, of the Bank of Ghana. Even in the most difficult times, uh, they are not saying what I have heard from some central banks that, you know, we're not going to introduce now. We we kind of put it the, the the central bank digital currency to the back burner. I think it's a huge mistake. Because you don't put off innovation just because you have some you know, some some problems. Exactly, this is the time when you have to innovate. And 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 thinking about Ghana, you know, first you think think about uh, a nation of of entrepreneurs, of innovators. Even during COVID, there was so much new innovation, digitalization. So that's what has to be taken over. And I, I salute the, the governor for for pushing with the, the central bank digital currency project because that's the future. That's the future in so many respects, and 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 I'm, I'm very pleased to see that that's uh, that in this area again the Bank of Ghana is taking the lead. Thank you very much. I stop here and happy to to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Piroska. I think you put the issues uh, in a much broader context, uh, in an international uh, context, and I think you rightly started off. <clears throat> Excuse me, you rightly started off by um, underscoring the achievements of central banking uh, in emerging economies, developing economies during the course of this century. And I think I'd also like to underscore that. And part of that, I, I think um, uh, Piresco also touched on this, has been the quality of the um, analytical work uh, that is being done. I know your head of research is, is here. Many of us have. Uh, had to go to your website to look at uh, what's uh, going on. And I have to say uh, that um, very good work is, is being done and on, on that front. Um, uh, also, I think an important point uh, that is sometimes missed um, that Piroska brought out is that um, uh, emerging economies, uh, the central banks, um, uh, started to react to this uh, inflationary period, the pressures much more quickly than, um, as we have seen, uh, you know, the uh, major um, uh, central central banks. And that I think also speaks to this credibility issue that uh, Pioska UAs because they know. I mean, you know that um, if uh, you don't, you know, react, um, the markets will punish you, uh, which is in fact uh, already uh, happening. Um, I also quite liked uh, uh, Pioska um, as you talked about. Um, yes, inflation is back. Uh, there's need to. Um, have a, you know a right policy mix uh, to uh, deal with this, but I quite like um, the point you made about the um, supply side uh, aspect. That um, this is not just a medium term or long term uh, issue. The number of things that could be done now, and I think um, Angela also um, uh, touched on this and actually gave us examples of uh, 
of uh, measures that could be uh, taken. Um, and here, of course, um, uh, good news, at least this week, is um, that um, uh, there is some sense that you cannot um, rely on protectionism either internationally or nationally. I think the uh, deal at the WTO that was announced uh, uh, this week, um, in some ways, is steppy, but um, it sends the right uh, signal um, you know, around the world that this is a time to open up trade. It's not the time to uh, close um, uh, uh, trade. And the same could be said uh, for Africa's own uh, trade initiative, the African Continental Free Trade Area, which um, should be part of this uh, response that would like to see it get off the ground very quickly. Um, because, you know, this too is, um, could be part of the innovation that we, uh, Piroska ended, uh, ended with, uh, uh, the innovative uh, responses that uh, are needed. Um, so I think, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, audience and also those who are online, I think you've heard um, uh, three very fascinating accounts of um, the evolution of central banking, um, also the current crisis and, and the, the measures and efforts that are being taken to um, respond uh, to it. So I would now like to open the floor for your own questions and um, uh, comments um, to the uh, the, the governor, uh, of course, but also to our two uh, distinguished um, panelists uh, as, as well. Uh, perhaps I could begin by taking questions in the room and I can see that the mic is ready to go around. Yes, um, uh, um, I see two hands uh, up on this side of the uh, room. And I do believe my colleague Fadel is monitoring what's, um, we've got five questions online and um, do please let me, have the, or, or do please read them at the appropriate time. So over here first, uh, yes, please, you have the floor. Hi there, uh, my name is Rachel Savage. I'm a journalist with Reuters. Um, Governor Addison, um, thank you so much for your talk. That was really, really fascinating. Um, when do you think inflation will peak in Ghana? And do you think interest rates need to rise further, further to bring inflation under control? Or does fiscal policy need to, does there need to be more action by the government in terms of fiscal policy? Thank you. I think we'll take the next question, which is also on this side of the room, and then we'll come to uh, the back of the room over there. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hello. I'm Jan Hendricks, and I'm a graduate student and researcher at the University of Oxford. And uh, I also wanted to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Edison, for your fascinating talk. And I have two questions to you. One was you talked about the issue of external financing and the downgrade uh, uh, of Ghana that happened earlier this year. Um, and also there were then subsequently some issues with the US dollar denominated uh, Ghanaian bonds. And I was wondering uh, what the next steps were that the central bank had in mind in order to deal with this issue of external financing, also in, in relation to the US dollar denominated uh, Ghanaian um, bonds. And the second question uh, is related to what Dr. Lusigi said. Uh, I was wondering uh, where you see or how you see the role of the uh, uh, Bank of Ghana in order to provide the necessary fiscal space and also the challenges attached to that uh, when it comes to economic recovery. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question and then our panelists will respond. Yes, please, go ahead. My, my name is Boku Frimpong. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of the Southampton. Uh, I want to applaud the Bank of Ghana governor and his colleagues for what they are doing in the midst of the challenges we face as a country. For some decades now, our economy has been described as having two parts, formal and informal, where the formal is productive and the informal is unproductive. But when it comes to the global north, the informal economy exists, but they don't describe it as that. They call it non-standard form of employment. So do you agree with me that we should move away of describing our economy as having two parts, but only one giant ball, where we have a policy mix and we see it as having a labor market with different aspects so that our policy mix will help those in non-standard form of employment, which form majority of our labor force. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. 
I suggest that the speakers uh, respond in the order in which uh, you spoke. So, Dr. Anderson, uh, please go first, uh, Angela, and then uh, Oscar. Actually, I'm tempted to. Is this working? I'm yes. tempted to respond to the last question first. This issue of duality, yeah. uh, economy being formal and informal. And this was a concept that we used to have in the development literature in the 70s. Uh, I think that the world has moved away from the notion of duality a long time ago. Uh, I'll give you as an example the financial sector in Ghana, where currently the objective is to try to have as many people included as possible, improve the access to finance issues. And you would see that a lot of uh, so-called informal institutions have been formalized, such as the microfinance institutions, where every corner that you turn, you can find a small microfinance institution that is uh, taking deposits and granting credit. So you don't find that level of dualization, financial dualization that you used to have in the early 70s. Uh, we rather what we tend to have right now are different tires of, of in the financial sector. You can look at the commercial universal banks. Now we have a development bank as well. And then below that, you have the savings and loan institutions. And even further down, you have the, the micro institutions catering for almost the entire spectrum of, 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 the, of the economy. Could I press you on trade? Um... Would you say the same for trade? I think for well, the you know, this is why I restricted myself to the oh, financial okay, sector. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I really don't know what to get into. <laughs> okay, okay. Because it's a trade, I think yeah. it plays out in the end. I think we all know the trade. Okay, okay yeah. very good. Yeah. <laughs> and then the question on the uh, external financing issue. Right? I think you wanted to find out what is happening to the dollar denominated bonds. Uh, <clears throat> the reason for which we had to take some of the difficult monetary policy decisions that we have taken. Uh, you look at the Ghanaian economic situation, you're looking at very high levels of inflation uh, in the context of very high levels of, of government debt, uh, in the context of all these shocks uh, impacting on the economy, which would have an impact on growth. Yet we tightened monetary policy on two occasions, right? And one of the reasons for doing that was to ensure that we kept you know, non-resident flows at home to support uh, the domestic economy. So yes, I mean, the external financing constraint is, is a major factor you know, in our circumstances. And we are doing the best that we can uh, to try to uh, manage or you know, keep the incentives right, keeping those investor flows in the local economy. And, and that brings me to the question from Reuters. Uh, she's more or less asking me whether we are going to be seeing more policy tightening or we think inflation has peaked. And we have been arguing that the pace at which prices have gone up in the last reading that we saw appears to be slowing down. Now, whether that means inflation has peaked or not is a different question. That we, we are hoping that given the uh, policy coordination between us and the fiscal authorities, as you're aware, uh, we have seen a 30% cut in, in fiscal expenditures for 2022. And as Pierre said, this cannot be done by the monetary policy alone. You also need that fiscal complement to address this uh, inflation situation that we are facing. So, this is where we are. Uh, we think that the pace at which prices are going to grow probably will slow down, but we are not sure whether we are. Okay. okay, so I think I'll address the, the question around informality. And to be honest, I don't think the solution to informality is formalization, right? It's what are the characteristics of the informal sector in many African countries? It's vulnerable employment, low return, on, on investment, no social protection. So those are the kind of things that you want to address by saying, how do we provide the incentives so that people move away from survival-based enterprises 
to more opportunity-driven enterprises that can grow. So, you know, I don't think you can just paint it as let's keep informality or let's not keep informality, but to really look at the root issues around why we have the informal sector. And we really want to see these enterprises growing, at least the viable enterprises, because that's that's where we have innovation and that's where we have job creation. So I don't equate that to the gig economy in, in, in other countries because here there's social protection, right? But there, if you don't survive, you don't survive. And we know what happened with, with COVID where there was a lockdown. I mean, there was literally nothing for for a while and and i think the case of ghana is is very instructive because the lockdown didn't last very long um it lasted um until there were there were solutions and a way to go forward so that people could still be able to to make a living so i think that's my short response but well, we can have a discussion after <laughs> uh, Piroska, um would you like to also comment um these are such excellent answers, and I, I would just maybe just uh, underline what what, uh, what uh, the governor has said that the priority now seems to be at, at this level of uh, of, uh, of of continued external shocks at, at this level of of uh, rising borrowing costs is to focus on 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 addressing uh, the fiscal space. Um, so there is not too much uh, in terms because that was a question whether you know, there is any fiscal space uh, for other things. The priorities needs to be set right, and I think uh, what the governor said is the right priority to address um, um, the uh, the price uh, situation with, with support uh, from fiscal, which means that uh, you know the deficit needs to needs to needs to reduce. Now, at the same time, what we have, haven't mentioned is is the what role for the IFIs, and 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 of course, Ghana is a, a very very respected member of the international community. Um, but we've seen the news about um, around the, the IMF uh, discussions, so that's that's a choice. But it's good to to know that there is this safety net um, available if if needed um, from the IMF uh, and and uh, other institutions of of, of Ghana's uh, choice. Um, I would just you know mention en passant that uh, the most important global financial safety net the single most important but most powerful are the currency swaps by major systemic uh, central banks the federal reserve and the ecb they were there and available at the time of the covid crisis i think they were brilliant they are not discussed too much because they might be perceived as with some conflict of the of the national mandate of the ECB uh, or, or the, the exact mandate of the um, sort of national mandate of the Fed or the exact mandate of the ECB. But the fact of the matter that when it, they were available, that, that you know, provided a, a powerful um, safety net. And I think that in, in, in a world where the Fed needs to tighten significantly to regain its lost credibility, you know, a somewhat lost credibility, um, keeping these swap operations for market pressure reasons um, in, in place is an important thing. I think it would be good to, to, to have the, this on the agenda a little bit more. Um, any other questions in the room? Um, we can, yes, uh, the lady here in front and also another lady at the back. Maybe the lady at the back first, yeah. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um. Yeah. So thank you for your um talk today. It's been very um insightful. Um. My name is Adele. Um. I'm an alumni. Um. And I currently work in technology. So I have two questions. So um. My first question is just about um looking to the future. We've been talking about some of the shocks that we're currently experiencing. Um. I remember a couple of years ago there was like a big survey done by the Future of Ghana and it highlighted um that in the future there'll be like a reduction in remittances going back into Ghana. You know, from people that um have left. You know, like families sending money back. So in the future, what policies are going to be introduced to sort of um deal with this? Um, are there going to be legitimate forms for people to invest in Ghana? And then um secondly, there was talk about digitization. Um, so I was just curious to know what the current challenges are and um, yeah, like um, what stage um, in the process of digitization that um, Ghana is currently in. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Wayo and I'm a member of the Chartered Banker Institute and also a board member for the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce. 
Thank you very much, Governor, for your insightful lecture. My question is similar to the second question from the lady that just spoke. So it's great to know that Ghana is trialing the CBDC. It will be interesting to know what successes or challenges you face so far and if there are any timelines in terms of when it's going to be launched. Thank you. I try to stay away from giving any timelines on the CBDC. Uh, we have a pilot running which should be ending in the next few weeks. And I think it will be a little clearer by then when we will probably be launching this digital currency. So now the earlier question on remittances, uh, which have been very important to stability in Ghana over the years. Uh, if you looked at the data that we saw in the early 2000s, uh, we're getting much more in remittances than in ODA. Uh, at the time, the ODA was receiving a lot of attention. So the policy really has tried to facilitate you know, remittance flows into Ghana. Right now, the issue of digitization is also helping. A lot of the fintechs in Ghana are participating in this remittance industry, all with a view to sort of reduce the costs associated with transfers. And, and the competition by the fintechs has really brought the, the, the transfer charges on, on remittances down. At the more macro level, we try to introduce uh, diasporan bonds. Uh, again, this was in 2007. Uh, unfortunately, that really didn't take off too well. But I think it's also one of the things that one can go back to and see whether they can be redesigned to interest the Ghanaian diaspora out there. Uh, and then the issue of foreign currency accounts in Ghana, which do not pay interest rates that are attractive enough for non-residents to keep their foreign savings in Ghana. This is one of the issues that somebody accosted me on. And we are looking at ways in which we can make these foreign currency accounts, you know, more attractive for, for non-resident Ghanaians. Angela? Yep. Thank you. Just a quick one on, on, on remittances. Um, I believe there are some studies that have shown that they were actually quite uh, resilient even during the COVID um, crisis. So actually people expected the flows to go down much further than they did. But the real question is, how do we effectively use that resource for development? Currently, it's mainly for consumption. Um, how do we package investment opportunity areas, for instance, so that people in the diaspora can be able to actually contribute to, to sustainable development projects? And one of the things that UNDP is doing is looking at SDG investor maps, trying to find out what are the investment opportunity areas across the country. And we've currently done it for 12 areas, and you can possibly find it on the SDG investor platform. But that's that's it. I mean, we have this flow of, of financing. How can we turn that into an additional area that will be able to fill some of these SDG investment gaps? Um, yeah, that's just a quick mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Prioska, any comments on what's been? Very quickly, this is, it, it, it's, it's, Angela is so, so right in, in saying that, that this has been such a challenge um, remittances in general, as, as the governor said, uh, has been more important than, than official financing uh, for years and more resilient, as we know. Um, yet it has, it, it has been difficult to harness it into a kind of a bankable product, so to speak. So it doesn't, it, consumption support is good. It's good, particularly when, when we have big shocks and stuff, but, but making it available for investment. So securitization is, is, is one form. And I just want to say that in some countries it has worked, in others it hasn't. So there might be, yeah, I mean, I, we can't, you know, can't go into details, but, but, but um, there are some lessons that one can learn from, from experiences elsewhere in, in that. Yes. Thanks. So um, the, f the first question is from um, Ubo Konko, who's the regional liaison officer for the um, African Alumni Associations. Um, and his question is aimed at Dr. Edison. And it is, what has been the fate of the ECO, the West African Common Currency, and when will it be launched? 
Uh, could you please repeat that again? The yeah, so uh, what has been the fate of the ECO, the West African Common oh, yeah. Currency, and when will it be launched? Um, then we have a question from uh, Angus Chapman, uh, an LSE alumni and researcher at IC Publications, which is, given the state of international debt markets and Ghana's external debt profile, why isn't Ghana considering a new IMF facility, uh, and is there a fallback plan? Um, should I just do one, one more? Um, then another question from uh, Kingsley Bikoe uh, from UNDP Ghana to Dr. Addison, which is, to improve resilience and adaptation of the impacts of climate change, green development pathways is advocated uh, for by many and is understood by the Bank of Ghana um, as has green, sorry. Um, sorry, it's understood that the Bank of Ghana has green financing, especially green, um, green bonds high on the agenda. Is it still the case and how is government working towards this and how will this transform the development trajectory of the country? And is there one more? There's there's quite a few more, but oh, yeah. take okay. three, <laughs> we can take this three. <laughs> Let's um, have another um, Governor Addison. I bet uh, we can. The UNDP gentleman should see me at home when, when I'm there, <laughs> and we can have a discussion on green finance. But the question on why won't Ghana take an IM facility, I think, was one of the questions that I heard. And I think that it's a good question uh, uh, for us. Uh, this is a, a period of soul searching, uh, similar to the earlier discussion that we had on the mandates of central banks and what role should central banks be playing in, in, in developing countries. Ghana has been to the IMF for 17 occasions and we are still in this situation, right? And I think that the Ghanaian people want to do a little bit of soul searching and to see whether there are other options other than rushing to the fund any time that the country is in crisis. And I think we should allow that process uh, to take place. At the appropriate time, they would know what the you know, right, right solution is. 17 times, we, we always come back into crisis. So what is it that we are doing wrongly? And do we really need the IMF to do that properly? I think this is the debate going on at home. The ECHO is still an idea in progress. Uh, as you know, this is uh, something that the central banks in the West African region has been working on, including David Luke's country, Sierra Leone, uh, <laughs> been working on this since the 1990s. And I think it's a, it's a good thing that the technical people that are involved in this project see the importance of having the appropriate conditions underlie the currency. Otherwise, it's very easy to print, print an ego and circulate it, and then the currency fails because that currency would have no value. But at least we have uh, technical people in, in West Africa who put a a premium on having strong underlying macro conditions before a common currency is introduced. And I believe that they were making reasonable progress till COVID came in and then the, the whole process was suspended for two years or so. More recently, I can see that we are trying to get back to the table again and you know restart the conversations on that. Um, oh, uh, maybe just uh, just uh, just uh, complementing on this echo uh, issue. I mean, just look at the eurozone. It is not an easy you know, <laughs> undertaking. So you don't want to do it unless you are hundred percent sure that you can, you know, qualify for a common um, a currency area in so many respects. Yeah. Um, so we can wrap up. Uh, no more. The, no other questions or comments from the audience uh, here? Uh, yeah. Um, anything else that you'd like to say uh, before we uh, close? 
Well, again, just to say that it's a time for soul searching for everybody. Uh, and I like, you know, the presentation made by curiosity because not many people tie the policy interventions that were implemented during the COVID to the current inflation crisis that we are going through. It was very fashionable at the time for central banks to be rejecting liquidity, quantitative easing, government interventions. And it was as if there were no monetary implications in terms of pushing that kind of liquidity into the system and whether that kind of liquidity would impact the price level. Indeed, when the prices started going up, there was a lot of debate on whether what we were seeing was permanent or temporary. I believe the Fed initially dismissed it as a temporary uh, development which would correct itself. And that's the reason why they did not immediately react to the, the inflation issue. But as you put it, we, we, we saw the, the, you know, the uptake in the price level and reacted immediately. And we're hoping that we will continue to remain alert and also uh, maybe taking in the caution that this is not a battle which only central banks will win. We need to work in, in coordination with other agencies, including the fiscal authorities and some of the agencies that are also working on the supply side, the importance of food production, the issue about you know regional cooperation and regional trade to create opportunities. Opportunities that are being presented by the African continental free trade area. As you said, this Afrexim payments and settlement it's system is really linking the, the central banks on the continent to be able to, you know, uh, settle interbank transactions among the countries on the on the continent. And they are piloting it with West Africa. Yes. So it's really the, the West African central banks that are currently piloting the PAPs. Uh, the intention is to eventually move it to away just from the wholesale sort of settlement arrangement into the retail end where you could even have fintechs and uh, mobile yes, yes. firms, you know, settling on the path. So it's a project that we are all fairly confident will help in terms of addressing the supply side issue. Thank you very much for that. Just for um, anyone who may wonder what the PAPS is, I believe it stands for the Pan African, Pan African Payments and Settlement System. System. Yeah, that's what it is. Look it up on the internet. Interesting innovation. Angela? I'd just like to, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting us to be part of this discussion. I'm very excited that Dr. Edison has told us that he's now looking at a development oriented framework. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll be following up on that, particularly on the issue around green bonds. Uh, but definitely this discussion has highlighted the important role that central banks need to play um, now in really pushing um, that enabling environment for investment uh, and expanding that uh, collaboration so that we can have that expanded fiscal space for development. So thank you very much. Piroska, you have literally the almost the last word. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a real honor. Uh, I think I would just uh, close by saying that that emerging markets have also come all together a very long way. And in the COVID crisis and post COVID crisis, we see that actually they have reacted faster and earlier and wiser than advanced market, advanced country um, uh, uh, homologues. So um, we see that the human capacity, the institutional capacity, institutional capacity is there in emerging markets. Uh, there are obviously weaknesses, you know, some things are given, the external shocks, the, the, um, the shallowness of, 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 of the financial markets is not going <laughs> to change over time. But the single most important thing is that there's a human capital and, and the institutional framework is there. And that I think should give us um, strong hopes that, that the current, uh, indeed exceptionally um, you know, hot environment uh, for central banks uh, will be uh, well managed, uh, supported by other policies as well. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Piroska. Well, it only remains for me to firstly thank you, the audience uh, here in this room, uh, for um, being um, so attentive um, and also for the questions uh, that you have uh, you have asked the uh, panel. And also to thank those who are online as well uh, for joining us uh, uh, this uh, evening and also for the questions that were sent uh, uh, through. Let me uh, thank Dr. Addison. Uh, I think um, you know uh, several people have commented on um, your, um, your your talk this evening that it was insightful and has given many much to think about. And uh, our two panelists, um, Angela, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think you have spoken um, for um, uh, the poor. Uh, I would put it that way as a true and good UNDP person. I think you have brought that uh, very much um, uh, front and center of your interventions and uh, reminding us um, the, what is really at stake in terms of ordinary people's lives. Um, and then also Piroska, whom I don't see anymore on the, on the screen, but just to thank Piroska for um, uh, bringing that broader perspective um, of uh, how um, emerging economies have uh, fared um, throughout the 2000s, um, uh, into this um, into this crisis and and some of the insi insights that we could take um, uh, from that and um, once again thanks to all thanks to my colleagues who have uh, put this uh, together our technicians and, and everyone and uh, let me wish you a very good evening and I do hope that uh, for those who are with us you do not have too much uh, hassle uh, getting back home so thank you very much everyone. Thank you.